All right, hello. So, um, in continuing the conversation, uh, teaching my son about the fear of death, I decided to uh, refer to the authorities on the subject, which is the early church fathers. So, I got I found a book. It's called On Death and Eternal Life by Saint Gregory of Nyssa. And so, I'm going to paraphrase the book so that I can actually give the full content of it. The only problem with that is that, um, like like with the Bible and the commentaries of St. John Chrysostom, it's really difficult to put those things in your own words and still do it justice compared to what the original writings were. I mean, they were saints. I'm obviously not a saint. I, I'm, I'm, I have all kinds of flaws. So... Um, but, for the sake of my son, and to help uh, my other children, anybody else that, that wants to know the answer to these questions, what the church teaches about this sort of thing, um, I'm going to do my best to try to summarize it in my own words. Um, the only the other problem with this is that it takes me a lot more time. Uh, I've got to be a little bit more careful with my wording and because some of this stuff is pretty technical and I don't want to be guilty of accidentally teaching heresy. So I'm just relaying what was taught by the early church fathers in my own words, trying to be careful about my wording as best I can. If I make any mistakes, forgive me. Um, so it takes me a lot more time, and I can only do it in little segments because I'm very busy. I have a lot of things going on. And I want to keep up with the other easier things to summarize like the uh, short Bible daily readings and, and commentaries and then the lives of the saints. So anyway, let's start with this. Uh, on Death and Eternal Life by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Introduction. The human, humanist theologian is what the book calls him. This is the introduction. So this isn't actually his writings. This is the commentary of the people who uh, published the book. I got this off of audible.com. Uh, which is Amazon based, I think. So, introduction, a humanist theologian. He was the brother of St. Basil of Caesarea. He was born to an affluent Greek family, well educated in law and philosophy. Around the year 350, Christianity was becoming popular, and it was during this period that Christian leaders spent a lot of effort explaining Christianity to the pagan and uneducated. He was close friends with Gregory of Nazianzus. Basil the Elder was his father, and he was a teacher of rhetoric. He was also a Christian. His mother Amelia was converted by Gregory the Wonderworker, who was a disciple of Origen. He was very knowledgeable of natural sciences. He preferred to be reclusive. He wasn't a very public person. Uh, he, he was. He's a lot like my brother. My brother's the same way. My brother is, he's a very uh, reclusive, but he's also a salesman and a priest, so he deals with people all, all the time. So, But he prefers to be reclusive and quiet. Uh, he was lifelong friends with, uh, of other saints and leaders of the uh, Orthodox Christian Church of that period. Uh, by the late 360s and early 370s, he was married and had a daughter. Uh, a lot of the details are not real clear because this is all from historical writings and oral tradition. Uh, he was given, he was a teacher of rhetoric in that period. Uh, he followed in the footsteps of his father. Uh, but in 371 or 372, he was made bishop of Nyssa uh, by his brother, Basil, who was uh, bishop of uh, Nicaea, if I'm not mistaken. He was falsely accused uh, shortly after he became a bishop of mismanagement of church funds and was temporarily exiled until his name was cleared. Uh, after that he was well respected by the emperor and made one of the bishops of the Council of Nicaea to formally define the teachings of Orthodox Christianity to quell the conflicts and divisions being caused by various heresies and false teachings of that period. And basically the same heresies of the early church are still going on today. I mean, it's, it's the same stuff and the different names um, in some cases. Uh, let's see. He lived into sometime in the 390s. 
St. Gregory used his training and education to describe Christianity through the science of nature and philosophical critical thinking and speculation to challenge the listener to grow in comprehension and understanding. St. Gregory begins his talk on death and spiritual life by asking the question of what is the ultimate good for the human person. He concludes that it can't be limited to some physical aspect of our present existence and well-being. Human life on earth is a life of consumption. Our spirit inhabits bodies that require consumption of air and food and water in order to remain in existence. We are constantly consuming and eliminating during this temporary part of our existence. The ultimate good of human existence must be the life of the soul alone. It is a permanent and unchanging form of life enjoyed without any physical needs. It is a life that is peaceful and effortless, available to everyone. No danger. It is a life of the knowledge of the divine. And our breath is the Holy Spirit rather than air. The heavenly body is not the same as human bodies in this life. Many of the things we do in this life will not be needed in the spiritual life. We must be transformed by the fire of death to be born into eternal life. The impurities of this life are purged. In this life we must learn to use our free will to choose good so that we purify our souls to prepare ourselves for the spiritual life in God. All that is evil will be burned up by the presence of God until only the good and pure remain. The saints, it's not in this book, but the saints talk about the, uh, the constant struggle between uh, our physical nature and our spiritual nature. It's a constant struggle. And we're striving to reintegrate the balance and homeostasis, uh, unity of our physical and spiritual aspects to be united in Christ, which is that uh, restoration of Adam as originally created. St. Gregory is asked by, man, by a man of power and authority why infants and innocent children are allowed to suffer and die by God. Now this is specifically for my son and anybody else who's had these questions. He gives him a respectful answer referring to both the Old and New Testaments. Now, this is just the introduction, so we haven't even gotten into the whole thing yet, but this is just the basic introduction. So, the answer given is a great mystery, of course, but he goes on to point out that God wants us to grow into him. Sometimes, God sees that some children will tend to develop into harmful characters that fall into vices. So like a host who escorts people out of a party who are known to drink too much and cause trouble so that the party is not ruined and the person doesn't shame themselves, these uh, young children, these young persons are escorted out of this life into eternal life before they can harm themselves or anybody else uh, in ways that are not conducive for their eternal existence uh, in some cases. Uh, but that's really beyond our scope. So, uh, where was I at? Other times, such people may be allowed to stay and give themselves and others opportunities to grow from adversity, or perhaps they repent later in life after being humbled by the natural consequences of their sins. Only God knows the answers to these questions, like I just said. In any case, God loves and protects everyone for what is best for them, and infants and children and adults who pass may still spend eternity in growth and maturation in God's presence. However, some people will refuse many opportunities and not repent, and be of little or no benefit to themselves or to others. Only God can discern these things. Our understanding is to seek to be united with God in His likeness. Inasmuch as we conform to His likeness, we shine with Him, reflecting His light. Inasmuch as we are darkened by evil sin and unhealthy desires and attachments, then we are burned by such things in His presence. 
God is an eternal mystery beyond our comprehension, but reveals himself to us as he wills, as much as we are able to bear if we seek him. And so there's there's the key, the answer. So I don't want to ad lib too much. I kind of want to keep with what the saints are saying and not talk for myself. But I've read a lot about this and just basically we have to seek to grow and become like Christ and imitate the saints and participate in the church. The church is a hospital. It's a spiritual hospital. And it's ran by God, not just by men. Men are men are fallible. The church is infallible because of the Holy Spirit that runs the church. It's the head of the church. The men are and women of the church are vessels that contain Christ, uh, which we receive in Holy Communion. And the grace of God is passed down, just like the scriptures say, from the bishop from one bishop to the next, and by the laying on of hands and prayers in the church. And so where the confusion comes in and all the divisions and problems are the fallacies and sins of men and women who pervert, twist, and change the teachings and uh, cause divisions, problems. And so that's the counsel that this Bishop of Gregory and many others participated in to develop the Nicene Creed which defines what we believe as Christians and to clarify permanently what Christianity is um, these councils are what put the, the Bible together as we know it today before that they were just uh, letters, books that were passed around but these councils put together what the official Bible is so I don't want to get carried away trying to give a whole history lesson or a theology lesson. I'm not a theologian or a historian uh, officially. I'm just, it's something that I, my father did and I'm devoted to as a hobby and as a lifestyle. So that's a starting point. We all have to start somewhere. And so that's, that's the whole point here. So my son was questioning why he had these experiences and why he's suffering and, and is, he's afraid of dying. And so the counselor is, is very limited in what they're going to teach. The, the counselors have to deal with people from all religions and so and all cultures. And so they're, they're not likely to be teaching this kind of stuff. But this is the stuff that he actually needs to learn in order to come to terms and be at peace with death and, and understand these things. Uh, psychology deals more with how the mind works. Uh, in relationship to the body and uh, our behaviors and how to manipulate that but this is much deeper than that so um, yeah I'm just making this recording for him so uh, if he doesn't get it now he can always look back later on social media and see see what I said if I'm not around to explain it anymore but there's lots of people I'm just a I'm just a connection. So there's lots of places and sources you can find this information yourself from the scriptures and the lives of the saints and the Holy Church. So I'm rambling. Forgive me. Um, please pray for me, a sinner. Uh, hopefully I'll continue to do this, uh, you know, week by week. I'll do a little bit at a time in my spare time. Uh, God's will be done. Pray for me, a sinner. Over and out.